From the Walt Disney World Swan and Dolphin Resort in Orlando, Florida, it's The Cube. Covering Splunk.com 2016. Brought to you by Splunk. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and John Walls. Well, welcome back to Orlando. We are live here on the show floor at uh, .conf 2016 here on theCUBE, the flagship broadcast of Silicon Angle TV where we extract the signal from the noise. It shows all across the country this week. Of course, we're here with Splunk. And uh, along with John Furrier, I'm John Walls. And we're now joined by Chris Kurtz, who is a system architect and really a Huge advocate, Splunk advocate at Arizona State University. So Chris, glad to have you with us. Thank you very Pleasure. much, glad to be here. We could talk about three dozen things with Chris. <laughs> we got to tell him what we were just talking yeah, about. So, so yeah, we'll get to the Splunk stuff in a minute, but you've been at Arizona State 14 years, uh, 10 of which were spent working on various NASA projects that dealt with the Mars Rover project, yep. which I'm just fascinated by, that you were involved in. Arizona State was integral Absolutely. to, uh, to that, uh, those projects. Absolutely, I grew, worked for a group called the Mars Space Flight Facility, led by a scientist named Dr. Phil Christensen, and uh, he's a, you know, a NASA researcher, had four instruments in orbit or on the surface of Mars at the same time, and I ran, I was the computer guy for him, so I was the system manager, and I uh, worked on Spirit and Opportunity, both of the older rovers, and worked on Mars Global Surveyor and Mars Odyssey. So I did that for a decade. So when you told people, yeah, I got a job that's out of this world, you really meant it. Absolutely. You really did have a job out of yeah. this world. Yeah. And a, a large number of scientists have graduated and moved on to other fields and, and, and stayed in geology and continue to work with JPL and NASA and other NASA groups. And so there's a lot of people out there that I, uh, I help get their, their PhDs. Wow. My son's uh, at the University of Santa Barbara, a physics major, and he's always fascinated with the whole space concept and he's Absolutely. so interested. So are there a lot of young kids coming in? I mean, they must be fascinated by all the they are. science now has changed. Absolutely, and, and as a university, you know, our job is to train these kids and, and help them get future jobs and, and both undergraduate and graduate degrees, PhDs, et cetera. And, uh, that group is, is, is really focused on trying to, uh, trying to uh, um, uh, get as many young people involved as possible and make, yeah. make that available. Yeah, that's cool. Well, I mean, you certainly got a challenge. When you say you shipped your product, you definitely ship it, ship it <laughs> Absolutely. out of, out of yeah. this world. Hey. Yeah, no, no maintenance on that. That's beyond yeah, I mean, FedEx, too. I mean, when you're, when you're hanging the, around the uh, Splunk Trust, like, yeah, I shipped the product into space. What have you done? Yeah, yeah. Well, I put it on, on, on Amazon. Yep. Um, but I mean, all kidding aside, this is, the, this is the fun part, right? So you got a job that's real world, you got real instrumentations out in space and, and, and that's something you're working on. But behind is the data, behind is a lot of stuff that's the computation. Absolutely. Your day-to-day -day job requires data, simulations, you got, probably have some cloud on, you know, supercomputers on demand. You need to simulate, you need to do stuff to get to where you're going. How are you using Splunk? How was your job changed by Splunk? Has it changed your role, how you approach it? Yep, Has it so, so uh, Splunk was brought into Arizona State for the security group to pull information from our operations group real time or as real time as we possibly could. I came in at that level at the very beginning and have shepherded Splunk into a full-blown enterprise product. We started as a 50 gigabyte customer a little over four years ago. We're at a terabyte now. And, uh, and, and I've really been able to architect and shepherd Splunk into its position now. I work for our deputy CIO directly in the data analytics group, and, and our, our goal is to make Splunk into an enterprise tool that the entire university can use, not just security, not just operations. Uh, everybody is going to be able at the university to use it. And hopefully, eventually, even researchers like the Mars groups will be able to use Splunk. It's funny, Chris, take a step back, because you also have an instrument, instrumentation background legitimately instruments in space, but instrumenting an enterprise in a digitized way is really where Splunk's winning. Absolutely. People want to digitize and understand the data, the digital assets flowing around. Um, how do you get that done? How do you become the disruptor, the agitator, the innovator, all kind of rolled into one because you got to kind of get that spear in there and yep. clear, the, clear the way, right? I mean, yeah. how do you get that done? Yeah, so we started with uh, uh, an actual need. We had data that was in operations and that data needed to get to the security group in a timely fashion. And so we started there, and then as the security group used it more and more, we've, we turned that on its ear and turned back to the operations group and say, look at how good this is working, look at how much simpler this is making your job, let's bring in more data, let's bring in new sources of data. One of the common questions about Splunk is always, what's the ROI, I need use cases. I'll tell you, the best way to get use cases is hallway use cases. You're standing around with your coworkers, 
in the hallway or getting a drink of water and you say, I wonder if we could take this bit of data and if we could combine it with this bit of data and we could do something new with it. And almost every single use case that we've come up with has been this, I wonder if we could take these two pieces of data and combine them. And then also, well that's the kind of the intoxicating conversation, just people are like, oh yeah, let's do that. But then the ROI may fall down and say, well, I got to access the server or, so the risk is, oh. But now Splunk solves that problem because yep. you create a separate Splunk instance, all right? So we have one Splunk instance for the entire university, but we seg segment the data into operational units, into indexes, so that the firewall data is in one index and we can control who has access to it, and the server data is in another index and we control who has access to that. That allows our information security office to be clear about okay, who's seeing the data and where, what's important, and only the proper people are Does seeing it. Does that mitigate it. the risk? I, I think, fear, if you will. I think that mitigates the risk and fear a lot. And one of the things that I love about Splunk is that it's, as an audit tool, it's very comfortable. So that I can turn around and I have NIST compliance or I have other compliance and I can say, yeah, we're using Splunk, we're compliant, um, we can keep the data separate, we can keep it for as long as we need to. That's nice insurance. Absolutely. And uh, we can also use Splunk as both the carrot and the stick. <laughs> I was recently told by somebody that I was the carrot and the stick. So the carrot is, look at all this great data that we're going to bring in, it's going to be fast, it's going to be reactionary, you can use all the data in any way you want, you can produce these awesome reports, but you're going to get held to the fact that the data's in there, mm -hmm. and if the data doesn't show right. things that are working well, you're going to see you're, that too. You're accountable for that. You're then. accountable right. for that too. So you mentioned some areas in which you are currently applying Splunk, or using, deploying it. I mean, why not university-wide? Is this the time and resource issue? Or? Time and resources, one step at a time. Uh, I'm in the office of the deputy CIO in data analytics. We moved Splunk into that area specifically because we wanted it to be an enterprise tool that was not owned by security and was not owned by operations. It's a, it's a, it's a tool just like, uh, you know, I don't want to say email, but it's a tool that everybody in the university can use. So starting with the university technology office, uh, starting with the things that we have the manpower and we have the mandate for, but uh, starting to bring in others. Start, I, I'm an evangelist for Splunk on campus. If a, uh, if a researcher is interested, I'd go talk to them. I can show them how Splunk can be used in their research. If their research is, uh, is of a certain area, we may go to Splunk for good uh, and say, hey, look, we have a use case. Um, I did that recently with TGen. So it's a safe, is, it a, is it a safe zone that way by design? Because yeah. you're not getting political, right? Right. You get in. Absolutely, it's a safe zone by design, and we're going to start to bring in people who are asking, we're going to start to bring them into the fold, and then isolate them, and then if we need to set up yeah. a separate environment for NIST purposes, or HIPAA, or FERPA, we can go ahead and do that, but we want it to be an enterprise level tool. You're also a Splunk Trust MVP. I, I'm also a Trust MVP. You're working yep. within that community, and we've talked a little bit yeah. about the community already today, actually quite Absolutely. a bit. Um, it, it, does, there, it does show off quite a bit. There's always a, a handout, right? There's always somebody there to be helpful, and we find that to be a, a really unique trait it that's, is. Uh, that's evolved out of this uh, Splunk tribal uh, affinity, or whatever you want to call Absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah. this community is, is, is amazing. I've been in higher, tech, you know, higher ed for 14 years. I've been in the, the IT field for 25 years. I've never seen a community around a product like this. Absolutely wonderful. Why um, is that? Product's good, that helps, but Splunk gives you access to the people. That's the number one thing, is that any Splunk customer can talk to a product manager uh, or, or somebody who's developing the product and, and get feedback and provide feedback, and a lot of companies don't provide that. You can get to the salespeople, you can get to the sales engineer, you're never going to get beyond that. And people give up and there's no real authenticity to it. Absolutely. I found out a, a, a feature of a product I was just looking at today isn't available, and I said, well, I want that. And he says, okay, great, let's talk about that. Let's see if the product can go in that direction for you. And that, that's amazing, and they do that for all the customers. They're really listening. They really do listen. It, I, it was mentioned. Unequivocal. In, yeah, and it was mentioned in Doug's keynote you know, that, that they do listen. They're not always going to do what you want, but they are going to listen, and they really honestly do listen. Well, that's yeah, the, different. We had the other two guys up here, and I, and I love this, because you know, we're kind of joking, we're all old, old timers, you know, talking about you know, IRC chat rooms, and believe me, the stories in the old days were we, we're worse We're a big now. IRC chat organization. <laughs> and they were saying that they don't mind the brutal feedback either, which actually shows maturity for a young company like Swan. Absolutely. To actually, they want the bad feedback. They want the bad feedback. They want the bad feedback as well as the good. And the number of times this week, I've heard, 
can I, can I get your contact? Would you be willing to be in a beta? Would you be willing to look at a, an example of the product? One of the features that was in Doug's keynote is a feature that I have been working with Splunk behind the scenes for on a year and a half. I've been providing feedback for over a year on that. Just, yeah, that's I think the direction you go. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, that's the thing that we should, I think we should be doing. What do you think they should do as a community going forward? Because I was pointing out yesterday in our, our commentary on our wrap up was, they're really making a big expansion with, with the community. Why wouldn't they? It's already expanding. And that's a competitive advantage for the company. It is. Now the danger is, you can let it you know, overbuild too fast. I mean, they have a good DNA, so I'm not saying that's the case, but they got to worry about that. I mean, yeah, you, how do you keep that in check? How do you grow an organic community fast while maintaining all the benefits? I, I think that's a very hard problem. So I think that you need to continue to grow the community, continue to grow the trust. The trust got a little larger this year. Trust members vote on upcoming trust members, and then we turn that information over to Splunk and they have the final say. But yeah, you got to grow that. You got to represent all of the different areas. There's two people in higher ed who are members of the trust. Uh, there's a bunch of different industries that are- You're that are, in that trust. I'm, I'm in that trust. You're one of the two. I'm one of the two. Uh, and by doing that, you, you need to make sure that the customer is really continued to be involved, um, and if the customer decides to not be involved, you, you have Has to Has there been a revolt why. yet? I mean, there's always a revolt. At some point, there's <laughs> no. always growing pains. Has there been a revolt in the trust network? No, 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 no. We love Splunk and it's a product, and they do, they absolutely listen to us, so there certainly hasn't been a revolt. So there's no need for a revolt. There's no need for a revolt. There's, re there's chatter, yep. rumblings, but it's all positive. But we meet with Splunk senior, you know, maybe not senior executive, but meet with Splunk uh, people on a regular basis, and they do listen, and that's the amazing thing. It's different from any other high tech company. You always before. wonder, you don't want people getting jam stuff down your throat. And you see communities, as companies get older, they don't really be mindful of yep. the sensitivity of the human aspect of, of the community. All right, so I'm going to ask you the same question I asked the other guys. What's the weirdest use case you've seen <laughs> in the community? Because Splunk has so many use cases. What's so, the weirdest uh, corner case of, of coolness that you've seen? So not mine, but one of the, the sales engineers I worked with worked with a company that was splunking data from uh, snow making machines. And so they were bringing in weather data to figure out when to make snow so that you get the best snow for skiing. I thought that was pretty awesome. That is awesome. Say that again. So they were the so snowblowers. The snowblowers that to make snow on the mountains yep. for skiing. All right. So they're they're those snowblowers have a, an immense amount of telemetry on them. You know how much water, water yep. pressure, all that stuff. They're bringing in that all into Splunk and weather data to determine at what time is the best time to make the best snow for skiing. Now that's and it was die hard skier. So between seven o'clock and six a.m. When, when the temperature when, is our in best this range. window for the bed, lightest powder or whatever. I wonder Absolutely. if that was an East Coast person because in the West Coast we don't have that. You problem. don't need that in Colorado well, they do, they, they do, or. Well, they do make uh, snow. They have the lower elevation. Why, sure, yeah. Pennsylvania, yeah. Maryland. I thought that was an amazing kind of edge use case that, that. that's not you know IT security logs. So, so what's your elevator pitch? If you're you're you're, you're an evangelist and yep. uh, you're talking to somebody from. Uh, uh, University of Arizona, or uh, or University of Denver, whatever, you know, another university type uh, who's who's looking. Yep. What do you tell them? Splunk can take any log you want. It doesn't matter what its type, it doesn't matter what its format. You can get it into Splunk, and then you can compare, and you can do transactions. So you can look at authentication, and firewall data, and web server, and temperature in the room, and whatever you want. And no other product is as flexible to let you do that. It doesn't matter what the data is, you can get it in Splunk very easy, very fast, and honestly at a very convenient price. What about people who want to bring Splunk as a central nerve center for data? I so, think that's definitely the way to so go. Let's just, say, let's just say I have all this Firehose Twitter data, and I want to jam that in there, and I have all this point of sale data, can I jam that in there? Yep. Would that work? Absolutely, we bring in Twitter data. Uh, we look at uh, Arizona State's uh, incoming feed of, of mentions, and then we're able to send that to the appropriate group, and maybe a student has an issue, and we want to be able to say, hey, somebody needs to look at this issue, so we monitor that type of information. Um, we look at you know, the amount of bandwidth that the university is using, we look at temperature. Um, I'm working on a project with E911 to look at that data in Splunk and how to better, the goal is to better serve the students mm -hmm. at yeah. the best price and protect everybody. Yeah, and that security number aspect there too. Absolutely. Do you use it to shape network traffic at all? Because number one complaint kids want to do is they want to have a server in their dorm room so they can have servers and then have game servers. It's a, it's a future prospect, we haven't done it yet. Uh, but, it, but I think the goal is to put as much operational data in Splunk as possible. What's the coolest thing kids are doing on campus these days with technology? 
Just, I just want to, just we, curious. Raspberry Pi is everywhere, Arduino's everywhere. Uh, we have a, a very good um, uh, 3D printer program in our, in our uh, engineering school. We have a very active um, uh, uh, program for um, uh, some of the robotics clubs. And so the technology that's, you know, that, that in my age, when I was a kid, was unheard of is now $25 and sitting on their desk. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the tech culture has certainly broadened too. It used to be us geeks, like, like now it's the tech culture as a genre. Absolutely. There's so everybody much has, touch points. Everybody has four devices. You know, they've got their laptop, right. they've maybe got a desktop, they've got a phone, they've got a tablet, and they're all bringing them onto campus, and they expect everything to work. Great, how's the STEM stuff going on too? A lot of women in tech going on? Absolutely, a lot of STEM and a lot of STEAM. Uh, you know, add yep. in arts in there. Uh, and uh, I, I think that that's, a, that's the key to the future. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I've stayed at a university for, for so long is I really do feel like I'm, I'm improving the next generation. Well, the STEAM is really important. It's important to get that A in there because yeah. arts is really a key part of this now. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and can we make sure that, that we use Splunk to get John's son to class on time? Yeah, maybe. Can we do that? He's never on time, he's a physics major. I, just I don't wanna, even think he goes to class. I just thought maybe we could nudge him in that direction. One, you know, hit a 10 o'clock one time. Maybe not. <laughs> no, no. Chris, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, we appreciate it's been that. A pleasure. And uh, fascinating background you've had, but it's uh, interesting to hear about the current application too, and best of luck down the road at ASU. Absolutely, right. thanks very Beat much for USC, the opportunity. USC, right? Yeah, absolutely. Big game this weekend. All right. All right. Chris Kurtz from Arizona State, back with more here at Con.com 2016, live on theCUBE in Orlando. <laughs>